Good afternoon and welcome to the HAI Congressional Boot Camp on Artificial Intelligence. I'm Russell Wald, Director of Policy at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered uh, AI, um, or as we call HAI, or as some people affectionately say, hi. Um, we respond to both. Um, HAI's mission is to advance the concept of human-centered AI, which for high means, one, the technology is developed to benefit at, to the, towards the benefit of humanity, two, with the purposeful intention of augmenting human capabilities instead of replacing them, and three, to develop AI technologies that are inspired by human intelligence. Through this human-centered lens, we recognize the importance of governance and uh, the significant role that policymakers play in this space. That is why we are gathered here today for our first HAI boot camp for congressional staff. The goal of this rigorous multidisciplinary three-day training on AI is to ensure congressional staff are as informed as possible to make the important decisions about the future of AI. Not only has this cohort been given a baseline understanding of the technology, they have had or will have sessions ranging from foundation models to the impact of AI on the education system to the power of AI surveillance and what that could mean for the future of uh, governance. They'll also have an experiential learning opportunity at the Stanford VR Lab tomorrow. For our congressional staff present, tonight's events are the only public portion of the program and the sessions that will be on the record. That this includes the questions that are asked a panelist. Before we formally begin, I do have to thank our HAI staff that has spent an enormous amount of time, energy, uh, to, and dedication to make this happen. It takes quite a few people to do this, and so we're very grateful to the entire team. And now I have the distinct honor of introducing this afternoon's panel. For better or worse, industry plays an outsized role in the development of AI. From startups to giants, industry perspectives on innovation will examine that role and discuss how academia and civil society can play an equally compelling role in the future of AI. For expediency, I will introduce our panel, but it certainly does not do their bios justice. Jack Clark is the co-founder of Anthropic, an AI safety and research company. He's co-chair of HAI's uh, AI Index Steering Committee and co-chair of the OECD's uh, working group uh, on AI and compute. He's running a couple minutes late, so he will be here. Uh, Rachel Gillum is the Vice President of Ethical and Humane Use of Technology at Salesforce, and Dr. Gillum is an affiliate at the Stanford Immigration Policy Lab. John Hennessy serves as the chairman of the board of Alphabet Inc., the parent company of Google. And Dr. Hennessy is a professor of uh, electrical engineering and computer science and served as the president and uh, as, uh, he served as Stanford's president at a pivotal period for the university from 2000 to 2016. He's also a member of HAI's advisory council. And Susan Leotold is the managing director of C Susan Leotold and Associates Limited a boutique advisory firm focused on advising global leaders about complex ethics matters. Dr. Leah Toad is a member of the HI Advisory Council as well. And moderate, moderating today's session is Vilas Dar. He's president and trustee of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation and a member of HAI's Advisory Council. Please help me welcome today's panel. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? There we go. Um, so I'm Lost Star, as Russell said, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have to say thank you to Stanford HAI for bringing us together and to the many members of this Congressional Policy Delegation for taking time out of your schedules to engage with a topic that we as an institution at the McGovern Foundation think is one of the critical and defining issues that'll face kind of our society for the next 50 years. Um, I wanted to start simply with a little vignette. I know that um, for those of you who've been here through the last couple of days, you've been faced with lots of stories about the, the heaviness and the weight of the need for regulation around AI. But I wanted to start instead from a different place around the opportunities that are ahead of us. I uh, grew up in the Midwest, and I often like to say I had to make a choice between going left or right. I ended up going right and spent most of my career on the East Coast. But recently, I had a chance to go back to the Midwest. Um, but I went a little bit further north, and I spent some time um, outside of Rapid City, South Dakota. 
we as an institution had a chance to partner with a very small but mighty group called Natives in Tech. And it's a group of indigenous AI scientists that are operating kind of across all of the institutions, many of which are represented here today. But they came together to say, how do we bring AI to kids that look like us? And we ran a code camp for Lakota youth in South Dakota. We brought kids together who had never coded and were just kind of interested in AI. And in three weeks, here's what they accomplished. They came, they started by doing a series of nature walks through traditional Lakota canyons with a guide who taught them about plants that had been important in Lakota mythology. But this wasn't merely kind of a nature or outside kind of walk. Instead, they engaged in a practice of data collection. They took their phones out and they started taking pictures. And as they did, they started asking questions. And the guide started telling them about how certain plants were medicinal, some were poisonous. Some had kind of meaningful spiritual significance to the culture. And they went back to the lab, and in three weeks, they went from never having coded to having put together an app that any of us could download to our phones. Here's what the app did. It did where I can see, many of you already know the story is going. You could go and go on a nature walk through a canyon, take a picture of a plant, and of course it would tell you what that plant was. They had done the work to actually build a model. And again, I want to keep reinforcing this. These are kids with no technical background or skill whatsoever, but they were able to use off-the-shelf tools to actually build and train a model that did recognition of an image and tell you what plant it was. That's a start, that's super exciting. You know, even just being able to do an app in three weeks is not something that I think I could do at this point in my career. They had already figured out how to do a model. But here's what else the app did. Not only did it tell you what the scientific name of the plant was or its common English name, but it also connected it back to the name of the plant in Lakota in a language that many of these kids were really interested in but had never had a real reason to learn. And then in one aspirational step further, what they want to do now is take the app and connect it back to a library of Lakota myth that actually are connected to whatever the plan is that you took a picture of. And through this process, create a connection between land, between AI, between the app on your phone, and a cultural connection for each of us. I tell you that because it's one of the most amazing things I've seen happen, and to be a part of it, over the course of just a couple of days at the end of that three week period was transformative, but I also learned a few other things. In order to affect this on a, on a campus in Spearfish, South Dakota, we had to start by buying a set of $5,000 laptops. Now, to me, this is ridiculous. I live out on the East Coast, right? If we wanna host some kids in a coding camp, we bring them into one of 30 publicly available or university labs. But here's an interesting point. If you want to find a place that's publicly accessible that has enough hard compute, computer resources that will let you drive an AI model, you start in Rapid City and you start looking, and you have to draw a radius out to about Chicago before you're able to find a publicly available set of computers that are fast enough to run AI. We had to truck in laptops in order to do that. So there's a lot here that intersects between what kind of world we're creating when we think about economic opportunity, about inspiration, about innovation in AI, I hope in today's conversation, we're gonna talk a little bit about inspiration and innovation at a few different levels. Before we dig into it, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to start us with a similar story, a short vignette. Tell us what you're excited about in AI. What's something that you can, without qualifying it with an ethical need, tell us it's just something that is really gonna make the human condition better. Rachel, maybe start with you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I like to start also with the positive aspects. So I think the first thing that comes to mind, one of my daughters is hard of hearing. And it's been really exciting to see the advances for people with different abilities. So from, starting from automatic, automated uh, captioning for videos to even her hearing aids, uh, programming them, connecting them with different devices. AI can detect if you're somewhere windy or somewhere really crowded and change um, how it gives feedback to the ear to help improve hearing in different environments. So, Amazing. Fine. Thanks for sharing. John, to you. So I'm a scientist by background. I think one of the greatest breakthroughs has been what's happened with AlphaFold. I mean, protein folding is one of the grand challenges in chemistry and particularly is critical to the question of how do we improve drug design. Uh, most discoveries that are made at the lab bench, the vast majority of them never make it through the clinical testing process because they're not really viable, they're not efficacious, they have other toxic effects. Um, but protein folding is the key thing problem, the first step of solving that problem. This is a problem people have worked on for a long time. My colleague in the medical school, Michael Levitt, won the Nobel Prize for work. He started in his postdoctoral work 40 years ago. Overnight, 
AlphaFold beat the very beat 40 years worth of research. Now it built on that research. It wasn't it wasn't <laughs> that it didn't use that information, but it really advanced the quality of it, and that's going to help us all because we'll be able to do that drug design process better over time, save money, cure more diseases, help more people. Amazing. Susan. Thank you. So I love the question because in general, I'm very, uh, I take a very pro-innovation approach to ethics. Uh, I'm also going to go medical. Uh, I'm, I'm on the board of a company called Benevolent AI, and it's also about AI drug discovery. But I'll add one more uh, example, which is diagnostics. It's absolutely incredible that in, in many hospitals, uh, you can go have a mammogram or a skin cancer evaluation, and the diagnostics are so much more powerful than just the human capability. And the best part of it, and we can perhaps dig into this later, is that it is one circumstance where there is always a human in the loop. The doctor is going to check that diagnostic and is going to then decide to act on it. So it isn't just uh, the AI left on its own, but it's incredibly powerful and life-saving. Jack? Thank you. Uh, I'll give you an example of some of these large foundation models that are being developed these days. And one of the most exciting traits of them is they have traits that you don't realize are in there until you get a subject matter expert to experiment with them. You know, we built GPT-3, put it on the internet, and then some coder discovered it could also speak JavaScript, and that unlocked a load of interesting work on code models. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who's a dietitian and showed her one of the latest models we've built, and she played around with it and was like, this thing is about as good as me at my own job, which uh, led to an interesting conversation. But the point I'm making is AI is starting to create new capabilities that we haven't anticipated. And I think that that means we're at the, the beginning of a really steep curve of uh, exciting events. I got to tell you, these are really amazing examples. But at the end of the day, I'm a kid at heart. Like my favorite use of AI recently is probably the biggest drag on my work productivity. It's something that Pat McGovern, who's here in the audience, showed me. It's something called Dolly. Have you all seen Dolly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to play with it? Like I can tell you that I can spend an hour thinking about ways to put cute sea otters into all kinds of like movie scenes. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a great way to spend your time. It is a way to express creativity through AI in a way that we couldn't even thought was possible five years ago. And now you can build entire new landscapes by literally typing a little prompt into an AI system. You want it's to paint like Van Gogh? We can yes, do that for you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to sign them all myself, so it's good. Um, look, let's take things a little bit more seriously. So um, Rachel, you have done a lot of work, as I would almost say, as a tech ambassador, right? Talking about tech and where and how it intersects with the world. Tell me about um, how you think about innovation around AI from a company perspective but particularly how it intersects with people kind of at the end user stage of the products that you build? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I'm um, at Salesforce in the Office of Ethical and Humane Use, and this is really what we focus on is how our products are impacting and touching the world. And um, in 2018, when we launched our AI product, um, Einstein, actually um, my colleague Kathy Baxter, who's in the audience today um, actually worked with uh, different experts in the field, um, different engineers to really develop Salesforce's trusted AI principles to make sure that our AI was accountable, trusted, um, you know, in, in its development phase. And now we've gone on to actually create a whole centralized function and office that looks across our products to make sure that, again, we're taking responsibility and guiding the responsible, you know, design, development, and even deployment of our AI products. Um, and other tech products there. And so when we think about um, this process, and I can talk more about that, I think we actually think, um, you know, taking time to think about the impact, um, consider the unintended consequences of different design features and choices, um, that friction can actually improve innovation, right? When you actually have to stop and think about how can we mitigate some of these challenges and um, force that thinking, bring in diverse voices to really challenge you know, key assumptions that you really end up with a better product. Um, and so, um, and at, at the end of the day, I think customers really expect that as well, that, you know, that process has taken place and that you're really coming up with the best, you know, end product that's been thoroughly vetted and, and you know, worked through. One of the things, Rachel, that we found in our work is, and to just put a very concrete example about what you just described, is we've done some work around helping frontline earth defenders have better access to maps for things like understanding where poaching or logging is a critical risk. In order to do that, we tried to start by using off-the-shelf mapping software and found that there was a really fundamental disconnect between how people were using the product 
in a world where internet connectivity wasn't always there, in a world where they needed real-time access to this kind of critical life or death kind of information. And it changed the way that the organizations that were building the mapping software went back and designed the interface. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the work we do, it looks at various stages of the AI lifecycle. So um, we start from the very beginning as far as embedding those ethical principles in from the very design. So it starts with our employees. Every single employee that comes into Salesforce is introduced to our office, our work. We offer training to employees, again, to help identify some of these key risks. Um, in the product development stage, we are, again, conducting workshops with these teams, helping identify those key risks. And then at the end, really empowering our users, again, with guidance and um, direction, as well as features to help use the AI the way it was intended with these ethical features. And yes, we have sort of that feedback loop, talking to customers, making those changes and adjustments. So it's definitely a full life cycle process. Got it, thank you, that's great. John, I wanna to come to you, and I know there's a broad set of topics here that you can speak to, but I'm gonna ask one question that I hope you get to as well. One of the things that I know um, this group was exposed to yesterday um, when James was speaking with Feifei was the idea that these large foundation models are still held in a relatively few hands. And the idea of developing them for the public creates some real ethical questions about what happens when you take a model like this, release it to the public, and it gets used for nefarious purposes. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit to kind of how we think about innovating around foundation models, how we make them accessible, but also how we make sure they're used for good. Yeah, I, I think you hit on a number of complex problems here. First of all, the scale of these models is such that very few uh, companies either have, e either have the person power or the computational power. The amount of computational power is phenomenal. One of these models may take essentially a year's worth of supercomputer time to train. So the, the amount, and the other thing we're learning, which Jack hinted at, is more parameters makes the models better. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really astonishing. I mean, GPT-3 has, what, 150 billion parameters, 180. roughly? 180. You guys did 580 recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the new <laughs> Lambda, the new one that Google just did, has more. But, and, and it's amazing. It, learned, it could do more things. And so we're not sure when that's going to end and how that's going to affect availability. The other thing that's happening is we're, we're changing the way we design computers because this application, which I think of as programming with data rather than programming with code in the traditional sense, is just exploding. So you need to rethink how you're going to design machines to do this efficiently. And this is an area where, uh, happily, the US is in a big lead. And as long as we get semiconductors, we'll be just fine um, because we do have a big lead there. Um, so I think we're constantly thinking about this. Now, you, you, the other part of this problem is foundation models can be used for good or bad because they read the entire internet. They read the bad things on the internet as well as the good things on the internet. And how do you tame that and ensure that they're going to be used in, in ways we, both as the model creators, but also as a society, are happy with? And I think we're still gonna, we're gonna struggle with this problem. It's not a simple problem at all. I'm gonna push you on this, John. You've laid out the problem very well for us. Any ideas or compass headings on how we think about the answer? You know, and we're gonna come I, to I you, Jack. I know you have some Yeah, Jack has some interesting this, ideas, so. I'm sure. I think some parts of this we can deal with, I think, um, using AI solutions to it. Uh, we can use AI to police the use of other AI systems. And I think that has, a, that has a, 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 an important use, particularly around social media issues. Um, how much further we can push that, I think, is going to be the key question. And how do we ensure that the people using the model are doing what they say they're doing with the model? Because if there's one thing we've discovered, uh, people will find uses that not only didn't we intend, we told them not to do that, and yet they find uses of that, that form anyway. Yeah. Jack, I'm going to come to you, Susan. I'm going to come yeah. back to you if that's okay. Everybody, sure. if you don't know Jack Clark on Twitter, every, you should follow everybody here, but really, Jack is pretty <laughs> amazing on social media on issues of AI. Jack, let's yeah, hear the response. I'd like to get myself in trouble. Um, we have a project. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a job of a good moderator is to get you to get yourself into trouble. Uh, we have a project we're working on called Red Teaming. And Red Teaming is where you, you take a foundation model like the ones John was referring to, and you sort of run a, a sped up process of what Rachel was talking about, where you get a load of people to kind of adversarially use your product, actually try and get your product to do bad things. But then the additional step is that gives you a data set of all of the bad stuff your model has been able to do despite your safety interventions. And then you can use that to retrain the model kind of away from that. You're like, don't do this. This thing where you give advice about making explosives, 
less of that. Mm. Um, and it does make the model like significantly more resilient, but it's an unsolved problem because now I'm saying to colleagues, I need a physicist who knows how to build decent missiles. I need a chemist who knows how to build really complex explosives because I don't know how to test for this. So I need like high status people to try and break it now. The other problem is bad is in the eye of the yeah. beholder often. Exactly. So you've got this difficult problem of who represents us. Rachel mm -hmm. said you need almost think of it as a jury that represents the community that says what the community standards are mm -hmm. about things. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to this, this comment here because where I think you're leading us is this integrative model that AI can't happen with technologists simply building models, right? Whether it's because you need juries or because you need kind of hard-coded human wisdom and common sense to evaluate, at some point there's an integration function that we're still figuring out. Before we get there though, Susan, you said something to me backstage that's really stuck with me. Um, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about innovation through an ethical lens and particularly on questions of moral obligation. So let me start by saying I think we're all very inclined to be careful um, when we see bad. Um, that doesn't mean we get it right, and if I may say respectfully say so in my first comments to all of you, it doesn't mean that we've legislated effectively enough. Um, but, we, um, but we all have opportunity to identify bad, and I would use social media as an example. There's some very clear things, problems that we need to solve. But one of the biggest ethics problems in my view is, is quashing innovation because the good that innovation can do, and that could be overreaching in, in legislation, that can be overreaching um, in other ways, or just having sort of visceral reactions to things. You know, I'll give you a concrete example. I think Microsoft and Amazon probably made the right decision when they said that they don't want to sell facial recognition technology to police forces until there's adequate regulation to protect individual rights. But what about finding that lost child in a crowd? What about, as one very large company um, senior AI person uh, gave me an example, what about making sure that people are not in factories, in parts of factories where they don't belong for safety reasons, or using equipment that they shouldn't be using for safety reasons? Or what about locating a terrorist? Um, so we need to be really careful that even though there is bad, that we're not missing the opportunity for good. So I think in terms of framing the ethical questions, we should always be looking to maximize opportunity and mitigate risk, and we should almost never be looking at uh, innovation in binary terms of yes or no, but rather sort of when and under what circumstances. Now there are certain things that are binary, racism, sexual misconduct, uh, clearly a lot of illegal behavior. But by and large, I think it's one of our biggest ethics risks is that we're, we're too um, quick to miss opportunity. And if I may give one last example, um, particularly from a US-centric standpoint, it's very easy to say, driverless cars, let's wait until we, they're absolutely perfect in terms of safety. Um, <laughs> we have safe roads, we have rule of law, we have road rules, and by and large, they're enforced. We have good medical care if, God forbid, somebody gets in an accident. But from the standpoint of developing countries, as many of you have been on roads in developing countries, have tried to get medical care that is non-existent. There is no rule of law. And institutions like the World Bank published staggering statistics, something along the lines of 90% uh, of the car accidents happen in developing countries where there are 50% of the world's cars. So we also have to be mindful of the opportunity, I'll use that word again, that you all have in regulating in a way that the rest of the world can copy, that is, that is a pro-innovation way and that is sort of conscious of, of um, where we sit in this, from this privileged perch. Susan, I'm curious, as we think about that a bit more, I, I recall a, a long conversation I once had with Cass Sunstein about mm -hmm. work around rear-facing cameras yeah. on cars, right? Mm -hmm. And what it took to really get through OIRA to get that into place. Mm -hmm. The story reminds me that a lot of the work around legislation has often been reactive to a publicly recognized harm. But it sounds like what you're talking about really is how do you do proactive regulation in a way that allows for innovation to happen? I'm curious if you have kind of a historical uh, example, a space that you look to to say, this is a place where this has been done very well in a, in a different or parallel field. Well, I think it's a great question. I mean, all of you are in such a difficult position because, uh, and your colleagues, because you can't really create regulation around something that doesn't exist yet. Because you're not scientists and technologists. You're very busy people with a lot of things to worry about. Um, and on top of that, uh, there's, there are all kinds of other sort of political realities. What I would say that we could do better at is already if we could deal with the, the dangers we know of. And let me just put social media out there 
as sort of one that we have known for a very long time about a whole host of dangers of social media, not least uh, threats to democracy through misinformation, um, mental health consequences, et cetera. So I, I think it's impossible to really get ahead um, and we can't expect you all to be ahead, um, but I think there's, what we, what we need to try to help you do, and by, by we, I mean the companies that do a great job of that, but also institutions like HAI to, to help you keep up with, um, with the reality. Um, Jack, I wanna come, back, come to you and wind the aperture a bit from the last question we mm -hmm. talked about. You um, look at reliability and safety in AI systems in your professional work. Um, tell us how you think about reliability in AI systems in the context of innovation? Ooh. Uh, I, think, I think this kind of has like two levels to it. There are some areas where you know that you can get an AI system that will be incredibly robust and reliable and you have really effective ways to measure and diagnose it sort of in flight. So there are certain types of computer vision, other things which are just broadly understood and we can get benefits from and we can know if there are problems. So I think that stuff you need to sort of widely distribute, but then the second layer, and I think John was alluding to some of this, these really big models that have tons of different capabilities, I think we need to think of a different way to roll out their benefits or to allow people to access and utilize those things with checks and balances because the amazing things about these models is all the things they can do and the challenging thing is all the things they can do. It's hard to build the safety tooling currently. But you know, per your points, we have to get the benefits from this because there are amazing things that they can do and it would be a real shame if we were never able to sort of deploy them at scale because we were afraid of, of, of things like this. Yeah, super helpful. I'm gonna take us in a, in a bit of a direction that that leads us to. Um, even as I reflect on this conversation and many of the conversations we have among practitioners, there's a lot of shoulds and musts and here's you know, what must happen. I'm always struck by the, the set of people who know the technologies well enough to come up with the shoulds and the musts aren't always the people who are making decisions about how they're deployed. You're all in organizations or work with organizations that have significant technical you know, competency and then a structure that's trying to figure out what the market looks like, needs, and will accept. How do we bridge that gap in really positive ways? I have a weird and controversial answer. <laughs> Let's hear it. Good. Let's hear it. Um, I, I think a lot of people who work on policy and, and product policy have like amazingly good ideas and good a, approaches, but sometimes they can lack internal political leverage within the organization because technology companies, like technology is the thing they're doing and everything else is stuff around it and you need to horse trade to get stuff done. So something which I did at OpenAI that, that I think was like somewhat effective and something I'm doing at Anthropic is building policy teams that also have dedicated engineers and computer, computing resources because then they can do their own explorations and evaluations. And I've also found that gives you more leverage about making deployment decisions because you have like technical artifacts or technical insight that makes sense to all of the other people in your organization. So that's my slightly controversial thing, but I think it might be an interesting approach. I mean, it's a good... It's, it's a good thought, I'll say, for as a product policy yeah, yeah. Uh, person at Salesforce, you know, it, you know, we are lucky in that uh, the formation of our office came at the direction of our CEO, so we've really been empowered to, you know, have a seat at the table in those decisions. We sit in the product org, mm -hmm. right, with the product leads, you know, it, but it is, you know, something we talk about among, you know, industry peers is how do you exert influence in your organization really effectively yeah. and really make the case for this work. Well, and I guess I just know that you, you have, uh, from the top, like they care about policy and so you're set up to have that natural leverage. And I think that that's, that's an amazing thing, but it's not always the case. Exactly. No, it's Where definitely not that. always. And I think there's still a case to be made and it's something yeah, yeah. we've been thinking about. And again, I, I think we do really see, even from just polling, like there is an expectation again among customers, among the public mm -hmm. that, you know, companies do take some responsibility, you know, and you don't want that big, disaster, right? That is a, a problem for companies. So you do have to think of ways to frame this, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because there is a business imperative connected to that as well. I'm hearing a few different things here. I'm hearing integration of, and I'm gonna broaden it out from a policy frame to the entire kind of human sciences piece, right? How do we bring social scientists in? How do we bring policy mm -hmm. folks in? And put them in places where they're making decisions side by side with technologists. 
I'm also hearing from you the requirement and commitment that you need from your C-level C, C team, right? Mm -hmm. You need to actually build this into organizational structure. Yeah. Um, and I'll push this one step further and maybe ask one more provocative question, which I was told. You know. um, <laughs> um, I've heard both Mark speak to at some length. I've heard your team at um, Alphabet talk about welcoming regulation, right? And being in a position that's really pro-positive legislative action. Um, how does that play a role as a forcing function around making sure that the technology decisions you're making are aligned with the social and stakeholder level decisions that you want to make as an organization? And John, maybe I'll come to you first on this. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. I, I, I think certainly it's the case that smart regulation can actually protect consumers while still letting innovation thrive and, and letting industry grow. And that's what we should aim for. So that requires forward thinking. It requires some thought about what the future is going to be, not just the present, and, and really understanding how to get that balance right. And I think so far we've done a good job, but, it's a, but it will be a challenge in this space. And we don't always know. I mean, I think anybody who said they foresaw all the negative consequences of social media is not telling the truth. Some people saw some of it. I mean, Cass Sunstein, the original version of his book on this topic was about deterioration of the public discourse on cable TV and cable news mm -hmm. and various forms like that. But social media just made that happen so quickly, right? So the, the rate at which things spread on social media, the rate at which they go viral is just phenomenal. And that's created a very different problem that I don't think we were entirely prepared for. And now the cat's out of the bag. How do you get it? How do you get things back in place? That's a really tough problem. Yeah. Um, Susan, any thoughts on this question? So organizationally, there's no question that senior leadership has to buy in. And if there's, you know, I do a lot of work with very large companies um, on uh, AI ethics advisory boards. And if there's one reason why they don't work, it's that they're not protected enough in terms of confidentiality, and they're not. Um, connected enough to the board and the senior management team in a non-threatening, constructive way. And obviously, advisory boards don't make decisions, um, but there's a way to design them where they, in a very time-effective way, they can be connected at the most at the most senior level. Um, the other thing I would say is that you know this whole, just to broaden the lens a, a little bit, these ethics challenges are multi-stakeholder challenges. So the companies have a role to play. You all have an important role to play. Consumers have a role to play. The nonprofit sector has a role to play. And a lot of the question is about who needs to be doing what? Who has what role and responsibility in the picture? Um, one of the things that I think, um, just the final thing I'll say is that where we're not doing a great job is making sure that the consumers, uh, particularly the general public, I'm not talking about B2B now, they really understand the stakes in what they're doing. So if you pick up a cigarette package, you see smoking kills. You, you understand what's going on. Um, most companies that have AI ethics um, sets of principles have transparency somewhere in the mix. In point of fact, that's not exactly delivered all the time mm -hmm. for one reason, which is that they also have either on their set of principles or sort of elsewhere, explainability. And most companies and most medical researchers can't meet the explainability um, objective for, for very good reasons, for just state of technology, not for any kind of ill will, just to be clear. But if you can't explain something, how are you going to be transparent about it? Um, and I think we need to be clear with the public. And there are myriad examples ranging from Robin Hood to social media to medical companies where the public could not possibly understand what the ethical stakes are, and frankly, what their own responsibility should be by reading 30 or 40 microprint pages of terms of service. So I think that it's, it's board level, but it's also connecting with the public. Fantastic. Um, I think we are going to come to the audience for questions here in a moment. I, uh, as a technologist, I have brought zero devices with me on stage, and I do not see a clock. So I'm going to assume <laughs> we're kind of on time. Um, so I'll invite you all to think about questions. Um, before we do, I'm just going to ask one more maybe quick round robin, which is um, I'd be curious from each of your vantage points, what's an area of policy or regulation that you'd really like to see the United States make a meaningful advance on over the next five years? Maybe, Jack, I'll start with you down at the end. Yeah. In, in CHIPS, we have additional funding for NIST to do measurement and assessment and reliability testing. And I'd say that that's an area where 
obviously industry is investing, um, but you, we haven't found a way to exhaust all the money we can spend on it yet. And I, I think it just suggests there's a huge public case to be made for the US to lead in coming up with the measures and evaluation systems, because that hopefully defines how you roll out the technology and it lets you have a normative interest abroad. Because everyone else will say, thank goodness they did the horrible measurement thing we didn't want to do, we'll just use theirs. Yeah, makes sense. Susan? Uh, I guess I'll come back to social media, um, because there's a lot that we know. However, to John's point about the future also, we're starting to hear about the metaverse. Just to be clear, I'm a student of the metaverse. I make no claim to understanding this. But I do believe that the addition of immersion is going to raise all kinds of new ethical stakes, ranging from uh, mental health to democracy to even sort of the, the opportunity for financial misconduct. So if we can't get social media right, then when we start in this so-called metaverse, at least as I've been reading about it, that's even scarier. And as John said, we need to be future focused because very large institutions are trying to make that future uh, happen quickly. So I'll take an easy one. It's not even AI. It's computer security and protection of information. Mm -hmm. we, it is a disaster out there. I, I grew up in an era where to be called a hacker was considered a good thing because it meant you were a super programmer. Now we've got established state actors trying to break in and steal computers constantly, constantly, constantly. Thousands and thousands of attempts to break into the university's computers every single day. Right? This is a disaster. I think companies are not held to a high enough standard. Um, I, there are some companies that should have just been put out of business when they released the amount of information released. Our own personnel office. All my information got released because I have a security clearance. And all my information, including my social security number, was in that file. Now I cannot do anything online for my social security. I have to go to the social security office personally because my number is out there and they don't believe it. Uh, by the way, some other person got a $3,000 tax refund from the IRS that they didn't deserve. But so this is a mess. This is going to get worse. It's going to create cybercrime. It's going to create a real mess. And I think we need to do a better job of figuring out how to hold companies and, 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 and encourage individuals to do the right thing. Right? To go to two-factor, put in a good two-factor system, do these sorts of things, which lots of people don't do. The problem is it's going to make computers harder to use, yeah. but it's going to make them safer. And so that's a trade-off we have to grapple. Thank you, John. Makes sense. Yeah, so. and I, um, it applies to AI regulation, but many other areas, I think there is a need for um, some federal-level regulation so that we don't end up with these piecemeal rules. You know, again, I have to come with the business perspective, but that makes it really difficult, right, to, to do business and just the way, you know, um, technology works. And so I think that's crucial, thinking about on the federal level as well as, frankly, internationally with some of the, you know, between the EU, UK, other markets to make sure we have some coordination as we think about how we're laying out these rules. Thank you. And I'll take the prerogative just of, as a representative of civil society to make one further plea, which is, uh, along with regulation, also positive frames of innovation economies that take AI tools and put them at the solutions of big challenges. Federal research funding, putting uh, money towards educational programs that train public service AI folks, and understanding that these tools have to be brought to bear on challenges like climate. Um, I think this will be kind of a space for a lot of positive innovation in government. With that, uh, maybe some questions, um, if we have any in the crowd. Um, I will remind everyone these are on the record, um, and uh, we'll try to get a few in, but I will ask for uh, maybe someone, people to introduce themselves um, and share information. Please. Hey, um, I'm Hannah with Congressman Crenshaw's office. Thanks so much for being here. I'm sitting back down. So um, I, I really respect that y'all have a very benevolent view of regulation. It makes it really easy for policymakers when we have a, a collaborative approach. Um, but you know, all of us know that so often regulations are not just this little narrow benevolent approach. I mean, we get folks coming into our office saying, here's how we can design regulation to be anti-competitive to another industry. Here's how we can design the regulation because frankly, we need CYA for lack of a better word and we don't wanna figure it out, we need y'all to. We have regulations that are taken advantage of through litigation to force other methods. So this is why like, we don't share set, and I'm speaking for only some of us, like I don't wanna describe this to everyone, but uh, can y'all um, help us play devil's advocate and say, 
obviously there's a lot of benevolent uh, ways we can use regula regulation in order to advance AI, but like where do you see some of the regulation being weaponized against the AI industry in order to like uh, prevent uh, better deployment um, and better innovation in the, in the area? So yeah. devil's advocate, I know everyone's been very pro regulation here. I mean, the, the testing and measurement stuff I mentioned is like it's dual use, for lack of a better word. You can use it to deploy stuff or you can use it to advocate that you create really hard measures that means nothing gets deployed. So that's an area we'll, it's necessary, but we need to be extremely careful. I think if we, if, if, if we take the example Susan brought up, self-driving vehicles, uh, we are so close to absolutely reducing the number of deaths on highways and that we can outdrive we can outdrive the average American driver. We can outdrive the average teenager by a lot. <laughs> Even the average person my age or the average person that's had a glass of wine. We can outdrive them all. So I, I think that's a case where we've got to figure this out and how to align it. And there are some, there are some industries, the insurance industry would not like to necessarily see the number of accidents reduced because that would change the whole insurance mechanism. And who owns, who ha, who's at fault when a self-driving car is in an accident? So there are, there are places where I think thinking creatively about those and realizing what is in the long-term advantage of society is real. And that's really your, your job is to look long-term and think about, as you design regulation, think about the effects a decade out or two decades out. Susan. So I completely agree with, with, with both of these comments. Um, just to add one more that's a little bit more of a process point. Um, it's very important that regulation can be enforceable and actually is enforced. <laughs> because regulation that is not uh, fairly enforced creates all sorts of other um, problems, not least inequality. But most importantly, from an ethics standpoint, what it does is it makes it arbitrary. So instead of respecting regulation and instead of it hindering bad behavior and encouraging good behavior, it basically turns the world into a big ethics casino and people are sort of trying to play the odds. So as a process point, one other sort of guide to how you think about this is, is the regulation that you're proposing enforceable realistically and evenly um, across all parts of society? And I'll add, Rachel, I don't know if you want to come in. I'll add one coda to this, which is I think it's also important to recognize that this isn't just nefarious actors in other industries, right? There's a political reality here that there is a public narrative about many of these technologies that isn't, as John just so clearly elucidated, aligned to what the technology itself can actually do. That's a place where I really think there's an opportunity for cross-sectoral participation, right? From a civil society perspective, we think people need to be able to engage with questions from a basic sort of sense of digital literacy to understand what's happening with tech and actually be able to evaluate the narratives not just through the Hollywood frame of one more kind of robot terminator situation. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Ricardo De La Fuente. Pleasure to be here with you all, and thank you for this wonderful panel. So my question is about competitiveness. On one hand, we're talking about regulation, but it, there's you know a city in China the size of New York only focused on AI. And as a business owner, they say that you must invest in AI now, uh, and you have a good chance of staying in business. But if you arrive too late, you won't be. But on the government level, whether the United States uh, putting regulation and China investing so much to be the leader in AI, do you think United States will be able to catch up or surpass China in the race uh, for artificial intelligence? I'm gonna, I'm it'll be talk. a race. It'll yeah. be a race, and I think it'll be the toughest race we've ever been in. Um, compared to what happened in the 70s and 80s when we were worried about Japan taking over a massive amounts of American industry, and we did well. We did well by doubling down on basic research, by doubling down on innovation, uh, by building new companies, by building the fabulous semiconductor industry that was built in the United States, and we did great. China is going to be a much more difficult situation. They have a large talent base, they're highly entrepreneurial, um, and they are investing lots of money. I think we're, we're gonna have to figure out how we maintain our lead in key technologies. That's gonna require everything from basic investment in research that starts in the universities and thinks about next generation, to ensuring that our companies can thrive as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to say, obvious that you all know this is a question that's been look, is looked at very carefully right now. I'm sitting on the um, US Chamber of Commerce's AI Commission where we are trying to think about this balance of 
innovation, competition, as well as, again, protecting rights and equality in this process. So I think that's the, the fine line where you need both public and private and civil society together at the table to work this through and think about those trade-offs and making sure that in the process of regulating and protecting those rights, we do allow for that growth and, and think about not only the regulatory piece, but also the investment piece, the research, the jobs, you know, those type of questions as well. So it's definitely multi-layered and, and complex. Anyone else? I'll just add sort of a, a more of a, a macro point here, which is that one of the most difficult things about AI is that it, AI has in common with other what I'll call borderless challenges, whether it's gene editing or pandemics um, or climate for that matter, is that it is very hard to regulate. We talk about the big so-called monopolies, but there's a lot of scattered power out there. There are a lot of people who have a lot of information who can do a lot of harm through AI, um, as, as John had said earlier. Uh, and I think the China question is, is part of a bigger question about how do we govern these borderless challenges? Um, and it's, it's really not an easy one. Just a really quick thing is increasing the amount of computational resources available to academia is very important because computation is fundamental to how we build and experiment with this stuff. And we're able to hire really good students from Stanford and other places who would otherwise stay here because we have more computers. <laughs> it's like, that's, you should fix that. <laughs> oh, I'll add one thing to that. Yeah, I, I, that's been something that's come up a lot in the conversations is the, the need to actually address immigration um, on this issue to be able to retain mm -hmm. talent um, in this um, work. So I just wanted to throw that, throw that in. So uh, my name is Alex Pendlin, visitor here at High. Uh, a couple of months ago, I ran a discussion with most of the prime ministers of European countries and the chief AI regulators. And my thesis was interesting because it provoked an amazing split, 100% split. What I proposed is that we couldn't really regulate AI because we didn't understand where it was going and it morphed all the time, but we could audit it. So you, just the way you audit redlining and loaning and things like that, we understand who the vulnerable groups are, traditionally the ones that have legal recourse, why aren't we just putting in uh, place regulations to audit it? All the regulators hated this idea. I, <laughs> uh, skeptically, it takes their job away to a fair degree, but all of the PMs and presidents loved it because it seemed like something they could do. Where do you come down on it? I'll, I'll venture, oh, please oh, go ahead. No. Um, well, I'll say it's definitely, at least in the, on the AI Commission with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, this very topic is being discussed heavily, actually. I think the question is um, the standards by which you audit. How do you audit differently the developer of the AI versus those who are deploying the AI? Um, this question about explainability. How do you develop standardized metrics for auditing, right, when there's all these different types of technology? Um, who does the auditing, right? There's a lot of questions about who does this and how, but I think it's an it's a excellent suggestion that at least our group is looking at very closely, um, given the rapid pace of change of the technology. I, I think it is impossible to uh, figure out a priori all the possible things that could go wrong, because mo what often goes wrong is not the basic technology. What often goes wrong is the way that technology gets used by somebody who's down the line, maybe multiple years, and certainly multiple companies intervening. And so we've got to find a way to deal with that issue. And I think doing it, doing it a priori is just going to crush the innovation. I'll, I'll share with you one of my most controversial lines, I suppose, right? Um, which is often when I sit with folks from tech companies, I say, actually, I don't really care very much about responsible technology or ethical AI. And what I mean by that gets to the answer to your question, which is we can't expect that the technological system has the capacity to do moral choice. We're taking two very different concepts and putting them together. So while regulators and policymakers have an obligation to think about how these systems are used, if we limit ourselves to auditing the results of a system in a particular activity, we're failing to take into account all of the societal, political, economic forces that are driving the creation, the adoption, and the use of those technologies. So is one mechanism to ensure that we're limiting a very specific set of harms auditing? Absolutely, yes. I think we should absolutely be on the process of figuring that out. I know here in the United States, like the SEC actually has stepped into this in a pretty interesting way. 
But we can't limit ourselves to regulating AI through that mechanism because it fails to account for, as John said, the fact that many of the second and third order effects here have nothing to do with the tech itself. It has to do with the human behaviors that are associated with it. Susan, I don't know if there's anything you want to yeah, comment on Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I don't think it's an either or question. I think we need some effective regulation. I think we need some auditing. And then I think we need some uh, just general commitment to monitoring and seeing where things are being misused, as John says, or where, thing, where new risks emerge. It's just, it's an ongoing process. It's not, a, it's not sort of one-stop shopping. But I think it's kind of a bit of both, each done right, and each kind of staying in their lane. I was going to make the same comments as Susan, so <laughs> if it, there you go. <laughs> Please. Hi, everyone. My name is Divya Ganesan. Thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate you hearing your thoughts. Um, I'm a Stanford student studying computer science and political science for some of the very reasons that you guys have given. But this summer, I also had the chance to intern for Congressman Kerry's office. And a lot of the information I heard was a type of like fear of the type of job displacement that's going to happen with AI. Um, I'm actually part of the HAI Emerging Technology Policy write up Challenge. And one of the things we're tasked to think about is how is AI innovation in particular not only going to displace and change jobs, but actually create jobs in the industry? And so I'm curious to hear from all of you where you think that new AI innovation is going to create jobs. Oh. Please. Sure, it will create yeah. jobs. It yeah. will create jobs. Will they be different than the jobs that it may eliminate or change or de-skill? Probably it will, and, and innovation tends to do that. It shifts jobs around. So what's our obligation as a society? Our obligation is to put in place the kind of training and educational mechanisms that will allow people to move into those new jobs. Um, and we're, we're going to have to do that. And what, I, what we worry about with, with AI is We've had other, we've had industrial revolutions along the way many times. What we worry about with AI is it may move faster than any of those previous ones, which is going to create a larger shock in the system. And we've got to be prepared, doubling down, re-educating people and preparing them for, to, to, to do, to get involved in these new careers, which may well be more lucrative in the long term than what they were doing before. But we've got to get over that hump. That's right. And I'll add a coda to that, John, which is we're particularly concerned not just about the speed of disruption, but also of the unequal distribution of impacts yeah. on different populations. No right? And I think um, we could have an entire panel or an entire class on this topic. But I do think the one point that I would add here is um, we can absolutely have that kind of very optimistic view to what the future economy looks like. But we have to be conscious that there are 5, 10, 15, or 20 years of massive disruption coming. Again, as a foundation, we're particularly concerned about rural, kind of low education, high sort of uh, physical impact jobs, right? Because we think they will be early to be displaced, and we're concerned that policy isn't going to have caught up to actually provide those pathways to retraining, reskilling, to even have institutions that are addressing these challenges at scale. So something that's very top of mind for us from an yeah. equity perspective. I mean, take aut autonomous vehicles. You yeah. start eliminating driving jobs. Those sure. are jobs a large segment of society, and it's not clear what other things they're prepared to do other than, other than that job. That's so right. that's a big worry. It, so Go ahead. It feels like some of it comes down to disparity of access. Like if I can access a really big model to do coding or, or um, writing stuff or, or, or molecular assay, I'm going to be a lot better at jobs that require, using a, <laughs> require doing that mm -hmm. because the model's mm -hmm. faster and better and cheaper than me. And so how do we make these models both broadly available but also teach people how they can pr really can use them in many, many different types of work to make their jobs better and easier. Um, one of our crowd workers we paid to red team our model also used it to write a recipe for another writing job she had, and she asked <laughs> if it was OK that she did that. And we were like, yeah, this is great, um, as long as you check the recipe isn't poisonous. But she did that, so it was good. But that's a nice example where through interacting with it, she was like, oh, this could actually help me in this other part of my life, mm -hmm. and then independently did that. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we have time for one more. Perfect. Hi there. Uh, lawyer here. Stanford Law alum. Yay. Uh, <laughs> long time tech attorney. And now, for the past 11 or so years, I've been a privacy and cybersecurity attorney. So, and some AI thrown in, which now is rebubbled up because of all of the privacy laws that have been incorporating automated processing of personal data and things like that. So I'm kind of taking off on the audit idea. Um, I am one of the few people I've talked to who are very disappointed with the EU's AI Act because it predisposes, you know, it, it pre-categorizes what's high risk, which I think is the wrong 
um, answer, especially as a tech attorney being very pro-innovation, as some of you on the panel have said. So my question is, um, we've been thinking a lot about repurposing the privacy impact assessment process for this type of, I wouldn't call it an audit because that does make people scared, um, but an assessment because we've already been doing that you know, now for a number of years. It's a risk-based approach. It's not supposed to be perfect. So if we're already assessing things for the impact it's going to have on privacy rights and so much of AI that people are concerned about processes personal data, right, things like facial recognition, then at least you're picking the high risk stuff and you're putting mitigations in place that then bring that down to an acceptable level and there's a balancing test on the good versus the bad. I mean, that's what GDPR does and I think it would have been a much better approach if Europe had kind of started there. So I'm curious if anybody has thought about it from that slightly different lens. <laughs> Any comments? Or I can well, it is a balancing act, I think, as you said, of, of both advantages from technology and potential harms. I mean, I, I think it's extremely difficult. For example, we talk about your phone knowing your location, right? Well, if you want to use a map and you want to use routing for either phone system, you have to give the phone the ability to know your location. So we've got to figure out how to do this, how to encapsulate it. We've got to figure out how to make it easy for people to say, here's how much privacy I want, here's how long I want you to keep my information, and make that as simple and as clear as possible. As Susan said, 20 pages of disclosure don't do anybody any good. We've got to simplify that and make it easy. And I think, I think I'll say that those of us in the tech industry probably didn't think about these issues enough. Um, and, and all of a sudden, we found out we had lots of people using the technology who didn't have the same knowledge and background that those of us who were techies had, and found this to be mesmerizing. <laughs> and so we've got to figure out how to deal with that better. And that requires incorporating, I think as Susan said, getting the social scientist in, getting the humanist in, getting the people who understand the technology from that perspective. And that's going to change the way the tech companies operate and the way they make decisions, I think. I think, um, just to add on to what John said, you know, I spoke to very senior regulators um, in the EU around the GDPR time uh, and senior politicians. And all of them said, well, Susan, you, you don't understand. You know, in, in certain countries, in Europe in particular, I could no more sell my data than I could sell my kidney. Um, so very, very different sense of privacy <laughs> as a society. Um, but I think the key, as John was saying, is choice, is how can, can the average person understand, and I really mean the average person, not the average Stanford graduate, um, understand what their choices are and how they can make them in sort of day-to-day -day life um, the way we might make a choice about what food we're, what, what food we're eating. Fantastic. It's a good note. Anything else as we think about it? Well, I think we will close there. I want to thank each of you, Rachel, John, Susan, Jack, um, I want to thank all of you for coming to this conversation. I know that we'll be around and happy to engage on these issues. Also, feel free to reach out on our favorite social media platform of the day. <laughs> um, happy to continue talking about this. And I will just end again on a note that um, I think maybe all of us, and we've heard it today, share an optimism that there is a world that's incredible, that's inspiring, that's creative, that's economically sustainable, that AI will drive in a really meaningful way. But I don't think any of us are so naive as to expect that it'll happen without really clear and direct participation from every single person in this room. So thank you all so much. Um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Before With that, let's uh, thank our amazing panel on this excellent discussion.